Hey guys, welcome to another webinar. This time is this is an exciting one for me. I will tell you, I'm really looking forward to this. We're going to talk to Scott Tazy. Scott is an architect, and I know him personally because he's done at least two sets of plans for me on a couple different projects that kind of morphed into different things. And not only that, Scott's helped me through the permit process in Washington State and Snohomish County, which is a little above my knowledge level, I will tell you, but not above Scott's. He's been very, very helpful for that. Hi, Scott. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate that. So the title of our presentation, Scott, uh, as you know from previous conversation, is Unlimited Possibilities from Your Designer or Architect. I've talked with you enough to know that you have a pretty big vision when it comes to looking at different projects and all of that. So tell us to start with, um, let's start with, first of all, what is an architect's a normal architectural job, if I was to contact an architect, say, here's what you need to do for me, what would that entail typically? What would the architect do for someone? Yeah, so basically we would have an initial meeting uh, either over the phone um, and just talk about the project and what they would like to accomplish and then have a, a set meeting so that I can see um, how the lay of the land is and stuff to be able to uh, see how what their thoughts are and see if it, it would be a better to do it one way or the other based on their location and the view and, and the lay of the land. Okay. Does that mean you typically come out to view the, the property, the lay of the land yourself? Is that part of yes, that process? De yes, definitely. Yeah, so that uh, once I get out there, I can see, you know, all kinds of out-of-the-box applications of how uh, the project can move forward. Uh, and then from there, I'll talk to the client and then uh, come up with the blueprints uh, that is what they're looking for that will be able to be built on the property or uh, whatever the scenario is. All right. Um, how much time, let's say someone's wanting to build a new structure, probably a new home. What's the time frame typically between their giving you a call and saying, I have this concept for a new home, Scott, need an architect to help us out, and you actually having a set of plans for them? So I can have a set of plans that are not ready for permitting yes. uh, and to get the floor plans and everything within a month. And then uh, by the time I get all the elevation, section cut, site plan, uh, everything, all, all this uh, uh, floor plans, the foundation plan, uh, all that ready for the engineer, it usually takes uh, another couple of weeks. And so you're looking at about six weeks to seven weeks to have it ready for engineering. And the engineer would be about two to three weeks to probably two weeks to get that completed. So you're looking at two okay. months. All right. So obviously the engineer you're working with is an integral part of what's going to happen here and creating a set of plans that are usable. Correct. Okay. Is there any application at the in within that time frame to the city or the county or whoever you're dealing with, or is that come later? So that comes as soon as it comes out of engineering. I will submit the, the uh, full set of plans, a site plan. If there's any drainage issues that get submitted along with uh, uh, the engineer analysis and the uh, all that updated on the on the blueprint so that it's a complete plan set. Okay, gotcha. So you're working with an engineer, you're talking with the client, you're probably there saying, oh, I wanna move this wall here and could you make that room a little bigger like this and all of that is part of that process, is that correct? That is correct. Also, if they wanted vaulted ceilings or open concept, all that is part of it. I also do the, uh, the kitchen design, bathroom designs, all that that goes with it. So okay. it's a full package deal. All right. Well, I think I'm going to bring you back to the process here, but let's let's get into the more of the fun stuff that I know you like to do. So they have a vision. It's just what I have in mind here, Scott. And then you're looking at it. Can you give us uh, either some ideas or the actual so, projects you've been a part of where you kind of enlarged on their vision or maybe changed it and they went, oh my goodness, I never thought of this and some of these unlimited possibilities we're talking about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about this one job in Bellevue. Uh, the guy wanted to be able to add a, uh, more room for his uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law to uh, come from China and stay there. And so um, I told him that it'd be very easy to go under his house. He lived on a hill and that we could dig out the uh, foundation or the um, all the uh, crawl space area and put a new foundation there, put up the posts and beams and everything that needs to happen to secure the up, up, upper floor and then uh, created a stairwell off of one side 
to be able to come down from off the edge of the kitchen uh, into this area. And so it wow. created about uh, 1,200, maybe 1,000 square feet of extra space. And there was an extra a bedroom there. And so every bedroom that you add on to uh, and have that permitted is an extra $100,000 in resale. Right. And right. so they end up having a, a, a bedroom, huge family room, uh, full ensemble for a bathroom downstairs. And um, I designed all that. And we had people tell us that that couldn't be done, but it was very easy. It just took some time. <laughs> and so I probably pulled out of there for 40 yards of dirt, maybe 50 yards of dirt. Wow. So, yeah, it was really good. Did you end up with the daylight basement concept on that? Complete daylight basement. That's exactly right. We cut out the uh, uh, stem wall that was there, the foundation stem wall, and then also the walls and added all the uh, egress windows needed for the family room and the bedrooms and put a smaller window in for the bathroom, of course. But it had all the natural light because it was on the south facing uh, hill good um i, I gotta tell you using easy to describe a project like that is probably not what most people would, would say scott that's really good that you said yeah we can do this it's not that difficult let's do it no everything is possible so what i i take a lot of pride in is thinking outside the box and yep. so like I've got one going on right now in Issaquah to where uh the family wanted to have a game room and a spa and all that stuff <clears throat> down underneath their house. And so I put uh, wide flange I-beams, 12 inches by 40 pounds, to, and took out all of their lower floor and put stairs down there. Now they, they have a, a huge uh, <clears throat> game room spa area down under their house. So yeah, it's all doable. It just depends on, um, you know, if it's done with metal beams or, or wood beams. And so both of them are about the same cost factor at this point. Wow. Okay. Scott, when you look at a project like that, these sound kind of like you know, pretty significant changes to these houses that you're doing. And you're listening to your client, the homeowner going, I really want to do this. How long does it take to formulate in your mind, okay, here's the idea that we're going to pursue? Is that like instantaneously when you're looking at it or does it take a little bit of thought and some drawings or how does that process work? Yeah, so basically, um, as soon as we are talking, <clears throat> usually I'll come up with a couple of solutions and then that solution, those solutions will get redefined or refined and within the next couple of days, because I'll think about it throughout the day and whatnot. And then I can go back to them and say, yes, I can make this work. And uh, <clears throat> then, you know, all their dreams can come true. So, yeah, so it usually <laughs> takes within a week. <laughs> you design dreams, don't you, Scott? That's you bet. Well definitely design dreams. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm going to bring it back to the process now, and we'll kind of deviate here and there. Um, the process of getting the approval with the county, city, whatever municipality, that's equally as daunting to most homeowners. So let's describe what happens there. And you can use, um, I, I don't know if there's a general that you can use between, the Scott's based in Washington State, guys, uh, up in Snohomish County. Do you work with different counties, Scott, or kind of where do you? We're yeah, so I just uh, have things right now that either came out of permitting or are in permitting in Whatcom County, Island County, Snohomish County, King County, City of Seattle. Um, and I, I have gone clear down into Pierce County, but that's just because I knew the folks that okay. were living down there. And so, but well, most of you, counties. If you don't know the geography, Scott, just to find most of the Pacific Northwest for Washington State there, you know. That's yeah, a lot of counties are. Are they similar to work with Scott, or do you find that they deviate a lot in what they require? No, right now everything, everybody is, is coordinating and, and having pretty much everything all the same. And so um, the city of Seattle may have a little bit more uh, things that would be needed for permitting, <clears throat> but for the most part, all of them are pretty much the same. So you're looking at about three months' time for permitting. Okay. And so. <clears throat> you have the intake, and then once the intake is done, it's put in the queue, and the queue uh, would be assigned uh, for all the different departments from uh, foundation, engineering, um, floor plan, water, I mean, all that. So. All right. So three months is to find the start date is from permit application, which means you have a complete set of plans all drawn up and you're ready to move forward. And engineering. They're all engineering. And engineering. Yes. And engineering. That's right. 
Oh, what other what are the other permits that are involved in this? And let's say you don't have a well and you don't have a sewer and all of that. What 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 are the permits required to build a house in that circumstance? Right. So you're going to need to have the septic design done for the property, and then that septic design will tell you how many bedrooms you can have. Now you don't have to have if it's a two bedroom septic system. You can still have four or five rooms that would be classified as, as storage or whatever. As long as they have egress, you could use them as bedrooms, uh, but they would have to, uh, they would not have a closet. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so that's very possible there. And then um, if it needs a well, that would be a, a separate permit through the health department. That's where it comes from. And um, uh, if it has a steep slope, then there's another separate permit for SEPA uh, or, um, the native growth uh, part of the permit to get that um, completed. Okay. Now, for full uh, clarity here, guys, Scott is walking through this process with a project we're working on right now beside our house in Snohomish County. So, Scott, how involved do you get with the other permits? Do you talk to the septic designer at all? Is there any conversation needed there, or you just need a permit? So I talk to everybody from start to finish, along with the contractors, or if they have something that comes up, if they're remodeling something. Uh, and so I, I follow the, the job or the project until it's uh, uh, finalized in the permit process. And I talk to every uh, everybody as in there, because I'm the one that's doing uh, the permitting itself, along with the, all the site plans, and I need to have all that detail in, in my site plans. All right. And do you have to have all permits approved before you can start building? That is correct. correct. Yes, all permits. All right. And so for those of us who've been through this and it didn't happen quite in three months, what are the typical things that delay these projects, Scott? So the biggest delay would be the site uh, for the site plan. All of the uh, building plans can be approved, but they won't approve the final building permit until like the site plan is done with the uh, setbacks and all of the uh, septic permit. And so the septic permit could take 90 days itself, and that would push back the whole permit process to six months. So right. it's very important to get the uh, septic design um, done and then implemented into the site plan and then your building pro project. Okay. Do you coordinate that yourself? Do you make sure everybody's on time right that they need to be? Or is that a homeowner kind of thing to do? So no, I, I definitely do that as part of my permit process, uh, but it uh, the health department is the biggest slowdown of that because they are the ones that have to approve it after it's been designed for a site plan. Uh, and unfortunately, you're not going to speed them up. And so whatever their process is, if it's 90 days or you know 60 days, uh, you're just waiting until that's done. Once it's finalized, it goes very quick. OK. What can a homeowner do to, first of all, be prepared to make your job easier? And and I'm going to ask this in context of somebody who kind of knows what they want to do, but maybe you have a bigger vision when you get there. So let's talk about through that. But what can they do to help you do your job? And what can they do to help this process go smooth, more smoothly and more quickly? So basically, once we sit down and talk about the initial project and the house, if it's an addition, uh, is to be able to... Um, have an idea of how much they want to spend. And so right now around the city of Seattle and King County and Snohomish County, the average builds is probably $300 a square foot. And okay. so if they want, you know, a, a huge addition, but it's not in their budget, then they wouldn't be able to do that. So and and getting down to where their their um, financial build is, uh, that's where I would start with the project. And then from there we would finesse it. Like I just finished this project that um, is in permitting or in engineering right now in the city of Everett. And so uh, they wanted to have um, a large addition and then also go up another floor. Well, when they got some rough bids from the uh, general contractors, uh, they were way over budget. And so I went back and redesigned uh, the structure. So it was just a single floor, but was able to add a, a breezeway into the garage at a detached garage and that gave them the extra square footage that they were going to have upstairs for a family so it worked out pretty good 
um, in the long run, but at the initial thing, they were going to have to go back to just a small edition. So, my God, that's really cool, Scott. I, I like where we're going with the conversation right now. So let's pursue this a little further. Budget is one of the big items for people yes. in building something. That's what limits them. What other ideas or whatever situations have you found where you're able to satisfy somebody's need for what they wanted within the budget that, first of all, look kind of daunting for them? Right. So let's say they're going to build an addition that's larger than what they want uh, to be able to uh, complete. They could afford the shell, which is the outside structure, uh, and they only want to complete half of it. They would only have to uh, finish that half, but the rest of it would have to have their um, electrical and whatnot. They just don't have to finish it. And so it'd be unfinished. Uh, and so they would save, you know, maybe 25 percent of the of the uh, bill. So by not having that finished, but they would have. So with the permit, you have two years to be able to finish it. So a lot okay. of times people have extra income coming in in that two year time and they're able to finish it, but they could still live in it and enjoy it until it was finished. OK, Does that happened a fair amount. People build the structure that needs to be built and then it's weather tight and then they finish the interior themselves over time. Yep. Yeah, especially if it's a basement. They can have that just uh, roughed in. Uh, even the plumbing can be roughed in and then come back and finish it, you know, anytime. So because the, all the engineering is done and completed on the structural walls and all the exterior walls and roof and whatnot. And so having the uh, the basement to finish or part of the structure is very common. OK, do they need an occupancy certificate from the county or whomever in order to live in the place? And, and what's the minimum requirement for that? So they would need one once it's finalized, they would receive it. But uh, there's lots of people that are, are uh, not trying to get it done as quickly as possible because of finances or whatever the situation is, or maybe they want to help some. And so they have two years. And so you can also ask for an extra year, so you'd have three years. And so you're still able to live in it, enjoy it, and finish it, and then finish that other part within the next year, two years, or whatever. It, you know the time frame that they're looking at so, okay, it, so they, it helps they can actually live there before the occupancy certificate is granted by the municipality correct okay they just have to have it done within that two or extra year period otherwise they would what would happen let's say they get to the two years and they're not done and they're living there and they need more time or more money what happens then scott so if it's just the interior finishing nothing because they can finalize it as it is, but if there's a more outside exterior work that needs to be done or the beams they haven't finished or whatever, then they would have to start the process all over again. So then they okay. would be paying twice for the permit fee and then you also have to bring it up to the new regulations. Right now they're in 2018 regulations for all your building codes and uh, probably next year they'll go to 2020 building codes. Oh. So right. yeah, so that that is one of the downsides that they wait too long. Got it. All right, Scott. Let's talk about the difference between rehab and new construction. So we kind of focused on building a new house, and I know you're you're involved with rehab of current homes, and like mm -hmm. you, you did that extra basement for the gentleman. What are the differences there from an architectural perspective and permit perspective, and for the homeowner? They're going to so do the a major rehab. Right. So the major rehab, you have the permit fee, and so. Um, it's all based off of square footage and they take the national average of what it costs per square foot to build the structure and that's what you're taxed on. And so uh, it just depends on uh, even if it was a, a new build or, or a remodel build, uh, the tax base would be the same. So. Okay, got it. Um, other, um, I think I'm going to phrase the question a little differently here. What projects did you get going that ended up in some problems that maybe we can learn from other people's mistakes that you can articulate to us? Okay, so I have one right now on Camino Island and uh, the client um, had uh, the septic field back on the back part of the property, but in, in doing the plan, she decided that she wanted to have a garage added to the end of her house. Well, that garage was too close within 10 feet of the septic field because the septic field was very large for the house that she currently had. And so 
we weren't able to put the garage there, so I ended up putting it underneath the addition on the north side of the property, which uh, uh, did create a, a little bit of problems. They had to take out four big trees uh, and then also build a retaining wall to be able to get into the garage. So uh, the septic septic um, plan is very important, and, and most of the time, the health department will not give you a variance on, on the 10-foot setback. Okay. I was going to ask you, Scott, too, what variants are typically allowed that you can, they will bend the rules a little bit. Is there anything in particular? So like the uh, roof overhang, if your roof overhang right now uh, is 12 inches and you wanted to have more, if it's on the setbacks of the house, they may give you a variance for that, especially if you have enough um, impervious surface to be able to uh, meet their calculations. And so if not, then you would have to keep the overhang at 12 inches. So a lot of it depends on uh, going there and presenting your case to the um, uh, county or city or whatever. And most of them are pretty good about it, but sometimes uh, they just can't have it because if they if they have you do it, then somebody else wants to do it. So. Oh, I see. All right. Yeah. Well, presentation is everything, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then who you know probably helps too. You probably know who you want to be chatting with about that and who not to. Yeah, and so I uh, like with Camino Island, I built a relationship with the people there because we can go in there and talk to them. And so uh, in my garden, I had pickles. And so I made cucumbers and uh, pickling cucumbers. And so I brought the guys down <laughs> to pickles and created a relationship with them. So yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun to be able to, you know, communicate with them and and all that so oh that's going a little above and beyond that's good scott <laughs> i like that um we're, we're almost to the point here i'm going to check and see if there's anything in the chat so guys of the of the webinar audience if you have any questions for scott now's a good time to go ahead and put it in the chat and then i'll be able to ask him as we wrap things up here pretty quick um yep. Scott, I, I I want to come back to a couple things however so this unlimited possibilities from your designer or architect Tell me yep. what you would tell our audience that they should, like you say, anything's not kind of possible. How should they think about this? So you got to make tips to kind of expand their vision for their project? Yeah, so basically if they have any kind of a view or, or just, they just want more sunshine. So I a lot of times will, um, if they have a flat ceiling, raise that ceiling up by putting in a beam there and then have a two by 12s coming out and the R30 insulation. And that opens up everything. Or even if they uh, uh, want to have a dormer, dormer put on it uh, and create a loft. It all depends on <clears throat> the size of their uh, roof, at what peak in, or what uh, ratio, six to twelve or whatever, five to twelve pitch, uh, and anything can be done. So having that open, it makes a huge difference to have the the height there and then the light that comes in. So yeah. um, everything is about windows. You know, and, and um, it's just it's just a lot of fun to be able to look at something and say, well, you know, we can do this and, and this and this very easily and and uh, meet all their needs. Yeah, you clearly enjoy your job in that respect, Scott, I can tell. Joy is asking a really valid question. She says you see more ADUs for the audience. That's an accessory dwelling unit built mm -hmm. on top of the garage. Are there any challenges with that? Can you share some stories around that ADU, Scott? Yeah, so I have one going in Seattle right now. They're building it. And so the uh, garage itself is usually a two by four construction. And so either the 16 inch centers on the studs may have to go to 12 inch centers, or you would add a one inch piece of plywood around the whole perimeter to oh. strengthen the walls itself. And so, and then you can build the two story uh, uh, or the upper story and have a nice, uh, uh, rental income off of that day do yeah detached accessory dwelling unit or even attached accessory dwelling unit you just tie in the roof to the side of the day do so yeah okay. very feasible are there any counties or cities that kind of discourage adus over others right now they're very popular because they um have the option of i have this going on in seattle also the homeowner owns the property but lets the home uh the, a new person is trying to get a house by that the structure on the property so 
it's kind of like leasing the structure on the property, but they own all the rights. And so they can buy this house for under 100,000 or 100,000 small 25 by 24 by 24 structure, let's say for $100,000. And that's a great way for them to get income and it's gonna build value and then they could sell it or whatnot. And so the other side of it is the rental income is huge, especially in Seattle, 2,000, 2,500 a month for something like that with the parking garage below if it's uh, detached. And so it, um, the possibilities are endless. So that all along with that, a lot of people during COVID wanted offices built. And so uh, you can have that office tie into a, a detached accessory dwelling unit or, or whatever the need is for the area, but they're very popular. Okay. Um, one more question I have here, Scott. What, what things should people definitely not do? I mean, we're talking about enlarging vision and the things they can do and all that, but there's some do's and some don'ts in particular that you should tell your clients right up front so you don't make the process worse or whatever. Is there anything we should be aware of? So let's say they want to convert their garage. Uh, they have to know that part of that, that garage floor, at least two feet of it, has to come out and they have to put R10 insulation under the garage. Uh, floor in order for them to convert that to livable space. And so uh -huh. uh, people have to realize that that there is a process that has to happen in order for them to maybe enlarge what, what they uh, would like to be able to do. But for the most part, if there's room on the property and there's enough in, impervious surface uh, and there's not a steep slope because that would um, activate um, drainage. And so uh, the best thing is to call me and talk to me or email me, text me. Uh, and let me uh, um, look up the property and then come up with a, a better solution uh, that so that their needs are met. All right, is there a consulting fee to start the thing or you can just go out and sit an initial conversation is free or how does all that work, Scott? Yeah, for me it's free, but if I had to go to Tacoma, uh, let's say which would be over 100 miles from here where I live in Stanwood, um, then I may ask for half the fare to go down there twenty five dollars you know that kind of thing but usually i don't have don't charge anything for the initial uh, consultation either over the phone or in person all right very good anything else you want to say scott the our viewing audience or and, and we have some folks right on the webinar now or maybe the youtube audience later on we'll have your contact information on the screen scott so you know they'll be able to contact you through that what yeah. else would you like to tell them so I'm happy to be able to answer any questions anytime. Uh, I'm very knowledgeable. I was a general contractor for over 25, 20 years. Right. And so I know exactly how the projects are built. Uh, I went back to school in 2007 and got my certificate for AutoCAD uh, in the school. And I've used that ever since. And so um, happy to talk to people and, and help them with their solutions. And uh, the biggest thing is dream big. I mean, have fun. <laughs> it, it's great to be, uh, you know, able to design things that um, make people happy. So yeah, anything they want to be able to do is all feasible. It just depends on the engineering aspect of it. And so like if it's with metal beams or um, whatever, <clears throat> whatever it may be. So it's a lot of fun to be able to talk to them and, and tell them all about it. Yeah, Scott told me one time it was the best career choice he ever made, guys, going from contractor to his architects now. And, and you can tell he really likes it. And Scott, yeah. I got to tell you, I've dealt with a lot of people in the industry in, in different places. It's really a pleasure to be working with people such as yourself that give unlimited possibilities to the client rather than what they can't do, you know, and say, yeah, it can be done. And here's a better way to do it. And Scott's really good about that, guys. I know that from good experience here. Yep, definitely. Thank you. So Scott Tazy, thanks for your time today with unlimited possibilities from the designer and architect. It was great. I always learn something every time I talk to you, Scott. I appreciate it. Yep. Well, thank you. I'm happy to help anyway. And if you want me to have me back, I'm happy to be back. So <laughs> thank you so much, John. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, audience, for being hanging out with us today, too. Thanks, Scott. Oh. See ya. Thank you.